there are connections between number theory, fractal geometry, and probability. And I want to present one of those connections here and how we study certain objects uh, and why Hausdorff dimension is an important object to work with when you're trying to distinguish things. And the motivating example for this is going to be a common fractal that we talk about a lot. And if you've ever had a class in measure theory or uh, if you've had a class in real analysis, um, hopefully at some point someone has walked you through the Cantor set construction. So this is how the Cantor set construction works. You have the unit interval. From the unit interval, you remove the open middle third, throw it away, and then you have two closed thirds left over. From each of those, you remove an open middle third of those, which turns out to be an interval of length one ninth, and you th throw those open intervals away, and then you go down and you do it with the, 27, uh, the intervals of length 27th. Uh, that are the middle thirds of those and you keep going down and you do this construction forever and the question is like well is there anything left over and the answer is yes and there's some real analysis reasons why but i want you to take that as fact for this video if you go ahead and look at the different levels of the Cantor set construction you can think about this as encoding it into a sequence of digits an infinite sequence of digits even right and so if you're on the left third you are a zero, if you're in the middle third you're a one, and if you're on the right third you're a two. And what the Cantor set construction does is that at each level it removes the ones. So the first level will be a symbol of zero, one, or two, second level is a symbol of zero, one, or two, and so forth all the way down the line. If you write down an infinite sequence of zeros, ones, and twos, you get a point in the unit interval. This is called its ternary expansion. And so the Cantor set is just the set of points in the unit interval that have ternary expansion that only contains zeros or twos. Another way to view the Cantor set is that the Cantor set is just these ternary expansions, or these sequences of zeros, ones, and twos, where the proportion of ones is zero, and you let the proportions of zeros and twos vary. So a question you could ask here is, what happens if you mess with the proportions? What if you fix particular proportions of certain symbols in these expansions of numbers? So we're taking this sort of like number theoretic thing of identifying points with some symbolic representation. The symbolic representation has this like fractal geometry flavor of stuff because you get these fractals usually when you do this generation. And then the probability theory is going to come up here in a second. And that's with the proportion and then also with some probability measure things. So the setting that we're going to work in for the context of this video is as follows. Let p sub 0, p sub 1, all the way up to p sub quantity m minus 1 be an m-dimensional probability vector with entries in the open unit interval. And we're going to say that that probability vector will determine a set of m expansions on the closed interval from 0 to 1 in the following way. We go ahead and let f of the probability vector be equal to the set of x's within closed 0, 1 such that x has a symbolic representation of infinite sequences of zeros, ones, twos, all the way up to m minus ones, where the limit as k goes to infinity of the number of j's in the first k places of that symbolic representation divided by k is equal to the jth entry of the probability vector. And that works for all j from 0 to m minus 1. That is, x is within this set of points of the unit interval if each symbol occurs in the symbolic representation of x with probability p sub j. And I'm going to often interchange the symbolic space of sequences with the unit interval in this video, uh, which we can do here. It, there's some reasons why that I'm not going to get into uh, in this video, but for the purposes of this video, they're interchangeable. So the first thing that I want to talk about here in terms of the setting is what is well known. So if you go ahead and have this scenario where all of your pjs is just equal to 1 over m, x within this set f of the probability vector is going to be what's called a normal number with respect to base m. In this case, it's fairly well known that the Lebesgue measure of this set is going to be equal to 1, and also the Hausdorff dimension of this set is going to be equal to 1 for every m greater than or equal to 2. And there's two cool things that are happening here. So the first thing is the Lebesgue measure sort of stuff that's going on, right? So since each one of these normal number sets with respect to a particular base m is full measure or measure one in the unit interval, 
then the intersection of all of them is also going to be full measure in the unit interval. So in particular, there has to be an X in the unit interval that is normal with respect to all bases. And that's a thing that should feel false in your brain, but it's true. Uh, the reason it should feel false is because we don't have an example of one. Um, that's current. I think that's still an open question um, is to derive a, um, or to find an X within the unit interval that is normal with respect to all bases and prove it. The next interesting thing is more a comment on size is weird. So in particular, we know that the normal numbers take up all of the Lebesgue measure on the unit interval and their Hausdorff dimension one. So they quote unquote scale like the unit interval does. Uh, if you doubled the unit interval, you would get two copies of this thing. That's very not formal, but it, that's the intuition you should have sort of for this thing is that um, it's, it's stretching like the unit interval and it measures the same way as the unit interval. But what about everything else? So because there's a set for every particular probability vector that you could throw in there, if you pick one that's not a normal, the normal probability vector, not the one where everything has the same proportion that occurs throughout the point, we can go ahead and see intuitively that all of these sets are dense in the unit interval from zero to one. And the way that you see that is you have to note that that limit or this limit from before doesn't depend on a finite number of first steps, which means that you can descend through the digital expansion of, uh, or the M digital expansion of the unit interval by breaking it up into M pieces and then breaking it up into M more pieces at each piece and keep doing that forever. And if you end at a finite step, you can always find a point in one of those pieces that is of size one over M to the K for however many K steps that you did. You can always find a point in one of those really tiny intervals that is in your set because that's only a finite number of steps, it's not going to affect the overall proportion of symbols within your point. The other thing to note is that all of these sets are different. So if you change the probability vector, then you're gonna change the proportion that a certain symbol has to achieve in order to be in a set. And since we've eliminated the case where you have repeating Ms or repeating zeros because the proportions are never one anywhere, what you're going to end up getting is you get all of these sets are disjoint from each other. So you have all of these disjoint, different, measure zero, dense sets in the closed unit interval from zero to one, and you need a thing or a device or a, a mathematical tool to tell them apart. And the question is, well, how do you do that? And you do it with Hausdorff dimension. Okay, so the proposition is that the Hausdorff dimension of f of a probability vector p sub 0 all the way up to p sub m minus 1 is going to be equal to minus 1 over log of m times the sum i equals 0 to m minus 1 of p sub i times log p sub i. Now, I'm not going to give you a complete argument, but I'm going to give you an idea of how this works. Uh, because it just uses some estimation stuff that we talked about earlier or some variations on some methods that we've talked about in earlier videos. Let's go ahead and just jump into it. Since j occurs with probability p sub j, we define a probability measure on the unit interval by saying that the probability that the first term in the symbolic representation of a point is j is equal to p sub j. And we extend this by saying for any finite sequence of symbols, omega and tau, that the probability that you start with omega and then tau is going to be the probability that you started with omega times the probability that you started with tau. Then by definition of your probability p, p of the set of x's within zero, one that start in the expansion with a1, a2, a3, a4, up to a n, is going to be the product from i equals one to n of p sub a sub i, which is equal to p sub a sub one times p sub a sub two times p sub a sub three, all the way up to times p sub a sub n. Now, from probability theory, there's this thing called the strong law of large numbers, which applies here. 
and that will say that for p almost every so this fails on a set of p measure zero so on the stuff that I care about with respect to p the following thing will occur so for p almost every x within 0 1 the count of j's in the first k digits divided by k will approach p sub j as k goes to infinity and this will happen for every j from 0 to m minus 1. Hence the probability of f of the probability vector is going to be equal to 1 because everything that doesn't live in that set fails the above condition and that fails on a set of p measure 0. So we go ahead and fix a particular y within this set and we set i sub k of y to be the interval determined by the first k digits in y's symbolic representation. So that is in particular that each of these i sub k of y's has length or Lebesgue measure 1 over m to the kth power. Now since y is within f of the probability vector, we have the convergence thing that we had from the strong law of large numbers happens for y. So we can go ahead and look at the quantity 1 over n log of the probability measure of that interval divided by the diameter of that interval to the s power. Doing a little bit of algebra and evaluating as k goes to infinity, we see that this quantity approaches the sum j equals 0 to m minus 1 of p sub j log p sub j plus s log of m. This limit will be 0 if s is less than t and it will be infinite if s is greater than t, where t is the proposed value of the Hausdorff dimension. And then to finish the sketch of this argument, what you would need to do next is you would need to do some mass distribution style arguments. So using mass distribution methods, one can show that the Hausdorff dimension is actually equal to this t value. And that would complete the proof. And so you have all of these different disjoint measure zero sets of the unit interval that all have these different Hausdorff dimensions. Uh, and you can sort of ask a question of like, well, is there a nicer way to break this up? Or in some way, what you've done is you've taken the unit interval and you've done this, this quote unquote, multifractal thing. You have split up the unit interval into all of these disjoint pieces. And for each of those disjoint pieces, you've been able to evaluate a dimension value for each of those pieces. And you've been able to do it in a nice partitioned way of you know exactly what properties the points within each of those sets have. And that's kind of what I do for research. And that was the point of this video is to get to this moment was to be able to say that I do stuff like this. And so in the next video, because um, I've kind of been doing just Hausdorff dimension stuff for a bit, the next video I want to talk about what I do research wise. Um, at a very general, like a very intuitive level. Anyway, uh, so that's it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more math stuff. Uh, I put out a myriad of math type things on this channel, including stuff about my academic life and doing math and going through grad school and all that. So if you want to see updates about that or just want to see more math stuff, you can subscribe to this channel. Uh, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and you can comment something down below if uh, there's something that you want me to talk about or if you have a comment, question, concern, or just an idea or something, at anything at all. It all, it all helps. It's all nice. I like to read them. Uh, so anyway, that's it for me. As always, I am Nathan. This one was Chalk, and I will see you next time.